Okay, recording started. Okay, so <clears throat> I don't know if Thomas, if you also want to record for whatever backup purposes. Excellent, thanks. All right, so basically the first thing that we will cover is the teaching material. So the course that we follow is programming with MATLAB from the software carpentry. The software carpentry is an amazing project where multiple uh, teachers and people who want to teach programming, but it's not just programming, there's also carpentry is about data management and many other things. They basically gather together to write teaching materials that can be reused by everyone. And this makes total sense. There's, I don't see much point in creating always new materials and always different slides and always, you know, you understand better than me, that then you can also go somewhere else and tell, yes, I've done the, the software carpentry MATLAB course. And then the new person that you meet knows what you've done and what are your, your level of knowledge. So the software carpentry link is already in your email and it's also in the HackMD if you scroll at the top. And now I'm in the first page of the HackMD of the sorry of the software carpentry course so in general what is interesting with this approach of teaching is that rather than you know going through the syntax of the matter language it's good to have a problem it's good to basically learn with the with the data problem and in this specific case the the goal of this software carpentry matter course is to be able to load different type of data which in this specific case are about some patients the data are stored in a common separated value format, which basically means that you have rows and columns, and we will check later how they, what they are, the rows and what the columns are. And then the goal is that <clears throat> we want to be able to load this data, this, this data into memory. We want to be able to calculate the average inflammation per day across all patients. And also we want to be able to do some plotting. So this is kind of a, very common workflow in many data science projects that you need to load some data, do some processing, and then make some figures that will end up in your scientific paper. So there is a prerequisite for this course is that you need to download the files for the lessons. So if you all open this page that I'm showing here, and for your convenience, I can also paste it in the zoom chat <clears throat> but it's also in the hackmd so from there you can click to the on the setup on the schedule and here you will get a link to the zip archive where basically the data are stored so you should be able to download this zip unzip it and then basically go with matlab to this folder and i will show this soon so don't worry. Then, so basically this is about the teaching material. Then the first thing that we basically need to familiarize ourselves is MATLAB, meaning the MATLAB integrated desktop environment or integrated developer environment. So now I'm gonna make my MATLAB full window. And hopefully right now, you're also able to start MATLAB and see something similar that I'm seeing. So if you are not seeing the same for whatever reason, you can click on this layout button and here there are different layouts. You, if, it, if this is the first time that you start MATLAB, you should be able to see the default layout, which is what I'm having right now. But of course there are other layouts. So for example, there is a three column layout and, and so on, or only the common window. Now I'm gonna, stay switch to the default layout and explain these multiple windows so the common window this is basically for those of you who are familiar with the terminal the common window the, the common window is like a program or the terminal is like a program that is like the smallest program that you can run on a machine that lets you interact with the machine so in a terminal in a common window we are able to type commands and then when we press enter the machine interprets our command and gives us something. 
so for example the most common command now that i'm in this command window i could ask what types of files are there so i could type the command ls and here i get a list of the files that are in the folder where i am right now so if you are familiar with linux and windows and sorry linux and mac this is basically what you know already but in general i hope you might have heard earlier but so in general what i want to say here is that the common window is like the most basic way to interact with matlab where you can interactively type some commands like ls to list or dir which is kind of a similar to ls and get some uh, some immediate output in this case the files where i am but of course there are other sub windows in this view and another view here is the current folder which basically is the folder where i am right now you also see the bar here on top so right now i'm in the folder z documents matlab and if i'm not sure where i am there is actually a matlab called command pwd you can also try pwd on your matlab then i press enter and it gives me this answer which is yes i'm in z documents matlab you might have a different path of course depends on your installation on your operating system but basically this is where you are and this is why when i type the command ls which means basically list i get all the files that i also see here in the current folder there's also these two special files the dot and the two dots so dot means the folder where i am and double dot is the parent parent folder then here in the same in this uh, default layout there is also a sub window called details this is this will be interesting later it's something that you can select one of the files and if there are some details it can give you some details so specifically the files that i have here have no details but i will show you later why these details is useful and then we also have the workspace so the idea is this if you this is kind of basics of of computer science so if the current folder kind of points to your physical physical device to your to the disk of your of your computer which is basically um, sorted or or arranged as a as a tree so you know i pick the tree which is called z and then i go to the branch documents and i go to the branch matlab this is how folders are stored however in a machine in a computer there is also stored something in the memory which is not the disk which is not something that is physically stored on the somewhere like files but it's temporarily stored in the in the memory so the workspace here is basically what we what we keep in memory right now which variables and soon we will introduce the concept of variables so this is the matlab interface but of course there's many other buttons here on top we don't have time to go through all the buttons and through all the settings but um, you will see how i use them that sometimes they can be useful and then later next we have another course which is matlab advanced that we all usually run in may mm -hmm. so if you also want to join us in matlab advanced you can see things like uh, for example timing the course profiling the course and using some of these more advanced features okay so now as i said earlier because of the screen and because it's nice that you also try the same things i'm gonna switch the layout with this button to common window only and make my matlab window vertical so that on the left hand side you see my common window and in the right hand side you see the the learning material from the software carpet all right so the first thing that we will learn is about working with variables mm. actually maybe first let's see maybe before starting with the with the actual carpentry material i think it would be good to mention also uh, talk something about the, the self-learning with MATLAB. So there are different ways of self-learning and self-helping. 
and uh, I mentioned already in the email and I hope you all created an account to Matrab Academy website. So the Matrab Academy, let's have a demo of the Matrab Academy because this is very useful. So maybe just a quick poll with Zoom. How many of you, like, can you all log into MATLAB Academy and let's see how many thumbs up or whatever is used in Zoom these days. <coughs> Let me check my Zoom comments. So can you please now log into MATLAB Academy and see if you see a view similar to what I'm seeing. And then if you see it, you can express your agreement with a thumb up or green mark or whatever Zoom allows you. I see one thumb up, two. Okay. This is good, especially if you're planning to do to, to get the credit, it's good that you test now this Matrab Academy because then you know you can, you know that it works, you know that you're able to log in. As I mentioned in the, in the email, it's good to register in Matrab Academy using your institutional email address because your institution might be covering other courses that are not part of the default Matrab installation. So the first basic course that is in MATLAB Academy is MATLAB on ramp. Now, if you you can do you can follow what I'm doing on Zoom, but it would be great if you can do the same while you listen to me. So, MATLAB on ramp is like the most basic MATLAB, and basically what we cover here in our software carpentry course is exactly MATLAB on ramp. We talk about the desktop and the editor, the commands, what we already cover. And then we will talk about vectors and matrices, arrays, calling functions. Basically, everything that you see here is also covered by the course today. But of course, if you don't have time to take the course or if your learning style is more like if you feel that learning interactively with something like MATLAB on ramp is more helpful, then I mean, you're welcome to, to, to learn through MATLAB on ramp. So now here I click on resume course. And uh, basically now start the MATLAB on ramp and make sure that I go to the beginning because I think, yeah, so the first thing that it shows is a, is a video. We don't need to, if I can stop it, we don't need to look at the video, but it's basically what I just told you. You can look at the video later if you plan on taking it. And here I want to show you how the MATLAB on ramp interface works. So the idea is that we still have, like it's like that we have now the, the MATLAB, MATLAB terminal, the MATLAB command window. It's just that now it's running inside the web browser. You see now this is my Chrome window. This is the, you know, so now MATLAB, this is not my MATLAB, but this is um, like a virtual MATLAB that is running on the web browser. And then here you will have a task. So, for example, here the first task will be multiply the numbers three and five together in the common. So I go to the common, to the terminal window, and I type three times five. Now we should expect that the answer is 15. I press enter. And yes, the answer is 15. And yes, we can now press a space to continue to the next task or ask if I want to try an alternate solution. Uh, of course, this is very <laughs> simple and trivial and, you know, this is nothing too complicated, but um, if you do more of this task, if you go, especially for the homework, whether it's this, it's not going to be MATLAB on RAM for the homework, but it's this MATLAB fundamentals, sometimes the solution might not be trivial. And so you can also have a look at the solution here, which is basically means what you should have typed in the common window to get the correct answer. So then I can press continue. And now we have another task. So for example, you know, they are asking us assign the three times five calculation to a variable. We haven't already mentioned what variables are, but 
we can see that basically they ask us to type something like m equal three times five. If I would do a mistake, let's say that I type m equals three times seven, I press enter and then the Matlab on ramp, the Matlab Academy tool is basically telling us, yes, you did a mistake and Rico, please check your, check what you typed or have a look at the solution. So you can understand that this is a, also a very fun way to learn, maybe more fun, more, how can I say, funnier than sitting for many hours on a, on a Zoom course. But the idea is exactly this, that you can you know, interactively type things, get an immediate feedback, and by doing all the tasks, hopefully learn as much as you can. In general, <clears throat> now exit the course, all the courses in Matlab Academy, I found them very useful. And um, there are, for example, deep learning on LAMP, on RAMP, that is uh, very well done, machine learning on RAMP, if some of you are into these things. But as I mentioned earlier, you must register with your institution email address because your university, in my case, Alto, is paying for some of these courses. Otherwise, I think in the default um, in the default courses, you only have access to Matlab on RAMP and Matlab Fundamentals, if I'm not wrong. Matlab Fundamentals is the one that we basically recommend if you want to get the credit. And so here it's uh, it's basically similar to what we cover, but it goes a little bit deeper. There are a bit more exercises for, for, for doing this type of work. Then, and I want to mention another thing about self-learning MATLAB, that uh, there's, of course, the MATLAB documentation, which is very helpful. I can paste this link on the Zoom chat. And uh, the documentation is really helpful because, you know, some people don't like to learn interactively and some people don't like to learn sitting in a Zoom. So another way of learning is to, you know, read the manual. So by just getting started with MATLAB here, there's many for every section that you click. I don't know why it wants me to send to the United States when I'm in the Nordic. So, right, so here you get like what we already cover the basics of the desktop environment. So we already done this together. We already done this together and then similar things that will be started soon. So another good way of self-learning MATLAB is to basically read the manual. And then another, the last thing that I will mention for self-learning MATLAB or asking for help, that you can also ask for help from the MATLAB window itself. So now this is my MATLAB command. Let me go back to the damn it, vertical screen. So in the MATLAB command, we, you remember that I typed the command ls to get the list of the files in the folder where I am. If I'm unsure, I can always type help ls. And so the command help followed by the name of the function or the MATLAB command is telling us something a little bit more details of what this command is doing. And of course, like let's say help plot. This is the most basic plot command. And you see it also in some cases gives you examples that you can immediately copy, control C and paste, control V. And then you, you can immediately get the working solution from the from the help itself okay so now it's 1242 and um, we still have um, eight minutes before our break maybe it looks good to check how can be if there's any question that is important to cover so somebody's having an issue with downloading the csv but i guess they managed to solve it and we can paste later the links for Python. Okay, I guess that um, <clears throat> things seem fine and well cover in a hack and be. All right, so we still have um, eight minutes before the break. So let's start with introducing the concept of variables. So now this is the software carpentry material that I'm pasting 
me to the zoom chat if you need to open it as well and i'll remind you that on the left hand side that's just my matlab command and on the right hand side that's the that's the software carpentry material i type clc which is a command that cleans my terminal so now it's nice fresh and clean <clears throat> All right, so the first thing that you need to do, that you need to learn with MATLAB is learning about variables, the concept of variables. If you've been using other programming languages, this is, you know, all familiar to you, but some of you have never used this. And of course, it's also nice to see how MATLAB is, is um, storing variables in, um, in, the, in the memory. So for example, here in this, uh, example that they have in the software carpentry material they would like to create a variable called weight underscore kilogram i type it so that you have enough time to also type it and also typing actually helps the memory rather than copy pasting so here they want to have a new variable called weight underscore kilogram and with a value of 55. now you press enter and you don't know if something happened if something didn't happen there is a way, of course, to, to have a look at the workspace. If you remember earlier, if you are in the default view, you actually see the workspace there. So if I make my window bigger and I click on layout and I click on default in the workspace, now I see that there is a variable with the name weight underscore kilograms and the value is 55. However, if we go back to the common window only, and the vertical interface there is also the common who who is basically telling me in the in the workspace which variables are stored right now that's the variable ans answer which is the default variable that we get and wait and some x and y that i did earlier i do clear all to basically clean my workspace and then with the arrow up i see the history of what i typed so the arrow up and arrow down are very useful. Now I'm typing arrow up and now arrow down. And then I see the command that I type weight underscore kilogram equal 55. You can try to type the same commands. I'm going hopefully slow enough for you to be able to follow what I'm doing. And now, so if you have typed this weight underscore kilogram equal 55, and then you type the command who, you will see that the variables in your workspace right now are just the weight underscore. All the other variables have disappeared because I've written the command clear all, which like clears the whole environment. There is another common called whose, so it's who with an S at the end, that gives a little bit more detail. So now it tells us that in my workspace, there's this variable here, the size we will see later is one times one, it means it's just a single number. You have to think then that these are like matrices, you know, so this is a matrix with one row and one column. And this is how the class, meaning that the type, how the, how can I say, how the numbers are stored in memory. We don't need to cover this, these details, but most likely if you've been taking computing or programming courses, you came across about different types and things like that. All right, so what is interesting, of course, or maybe what is annoying is that when we typed weight underscore kilogram equal 55 with a semicolon at the end, we didn't see anything. We were not sure what was going on. So if we type it again, but without the semicolon at the end, we actually get immediately in the screen the output. So you can understand already that the semicolon the function of the semicolon in MATLAB is to suppress what the output would be. Sometimes you want to see the output, like here, maybe I, I want to make sure that the variable weight kilograms equals 55. But some other times, if you run many, many rows, many lines, one after each other, you don't need to get, you know, the output of each line. So you can kind of suppress the output with this, uh, with this semicolon. Then, there are other functions to have a look at what's stored inside the variable. Here, for example, they mentioned the disp function. So disp, I say function, and uh, we will go better later on what are functions. We will, you will also be able to write your own function. But the idea of a function is that there is a 
command, the name of the function, and then in the round brackets, you pass something to the function. So this, this function gets as an input the variable name that we have created and will, in this case, produce the output. So uh, we also type it, this weight underscore kilogram, and then I press enter. And now this has displayed, that's why it's this, the, the value of that variable. You can type help this, and then you get an idea of what this disp command does. So this of x displays the array x, etc. etc. You can read the, the command. Of course, you know it's sometimes we need to store numbers, but MATLAB variables can also store matrices. After all, MATLAB stands for matrix laboratory. And the second, you know. If you increase now the dimension kind of of the variable that we store, the next step would be to store a list, which are also is also called an array. So now, when storing a single number, we were writing it weight underscore kilogram equal the number. But when we need to store multiple number, a list, an array, we use the square brackets. So now we do the same example that they do there. So a equal one comma two comma three the space is not required between the commas it's more for readability purposes and then i press enter and i get the same output from the teaching material so now the variable a is not just a single number but it's actually three numbers it's a list it's an array with three numbers and of course you can understand that the same thing can be done with matrices so here the next common that we should type is b equal so b is equal to a and here we get the semicolon again four five and six and now i don't put the semicolon at the end and hopefully you are typing the same so now we are creating a matrix now you just we just discovered another function for the semicolon operator then when we were putting at the end of a statement it was suppressing the output but inside the square brackets the semicolon is basically telling us make a new row in the matrix so if a was a row with three columns one two three here in the matrix b we still want to have a and then go to a new row and store the number four five six and this is why the matrix b has this shape of two rows and three columns all right so this is the most basic first steps with matlab it's good to have a break now because it's 1250 and we can have a break until 13. i will keep an eye on uh, on the hackmd but of course it's good to when when it's a break it's good to have a real break so let's get back here at 1 p.m o'clock
Okay, <clears throat> it's 1 p.m. And um, somebody, I wrote that question to the, I added that question to the HackMDS, someone asked via email that if you're not from Malto and you need to get the credit, if you do the exercises, you will get it. You will get a certificate that then you can give to your studies supervisor or whatever the person is and then you can register the credit into one ECTS credit but of course you might want to confirm with the study supervisor if they accept this okay so now we go back to the software carpentry materials so you got the first ideas of having variables in our environment in our working environment in our workspace and we created a scalar a variable that was only containing a single number we had an array and we also had a matrix so here in the materials earlier we looked at the function disp to display the content there's another function similar which is num to str you don't need to understand what everything is happening like and you don't need to understand what what the whole thing is about but once again num to string is another function that is converting numbers to string so now i could type also num to string a and this will convert or will display the array in the variable a here as a as a string basically it's nice that we are already seeing kind of example how real code is used and by using it we are learning you know when should we use num to string and when should we use this so for example in this other example in this other bit of code that we have here we will now like to store the weight in pounds so convert in the kilograms to pounds and so weight underscore pounds equals two times two times the times operator is this uh, star and then weight underscore kilogram and then i type the semicolon also and so now we can run this type of command which is disp which we are called earlier is this function and then now what is interesting here is that between square brackets we have a string that is weight in pounds and then num to string so now call me lazy i'm gonna copy and paste it from the documentation but of course it's nice to to type everything so you learn but now what is interesting here is that you see that these square brackets basically mean that what's inside the square bracket is an array so we saw earlier that a is an array of numbers but what it's interesting now here then actually we just create an array of strings where strings in matlab are defined with normal text that you would type between this apostrophe so there's a string weight in pounds and it's basically concatenated with another string that is the value weight underscore pound that was converted from number to string so you get an idea that basically i would say that almost everything in matlab or many many types of the variable store are arrays or matrices so when you need to display a string it's basically an array of characters because this is what a string is and of course when you need to store numbers you can store them as a array of numbers okay so of course once we define a variable it doesn't need to store that value forever so in this specific case here for example we want to assign a new value to the variable weight underscore kilogram so just to refresh our memory and let's see if we type weight underscore kilogram what is the value right now and Mata is telling us that the value is 55. Now we 
type a new value so I type it weight underscore kilogram equals 57.5 and now the variable as a new value however earlier here in this line here we define the weight in pounds equals 2 times 2 the weight in kilogram change in the weight in kilogram does not automatically change the weight in pounds this is because we did not kind of refresh the content of the variable weight in pounds so here it's also written here in the teaching material we just changed the value weight kilogram but weight in pound hasn't changed so if we have a look at weight underscore lb this is the old value 121 because the variable itself weight underscore pounds only stores the value it doesn't store the concept of you know being two times two times weight in kilogram all right so well here then in the learning materials they tell us about the who command that we already know about it they don't mention the who. I find more useful to have the who's with the s because then I get a nice list of the variables that are there and the and the size of this variable so you see here for example b was a matrix with two rows and three columns and uh, and you know and then weighting kilograms and weighting but of course if you if you if you have the full matlab window like i was showing earlier you see also everything in the in the workspace window and then another important common is the common clear where for example you need to get rid of a variable that you don't need anymore because you know that in the next iteration that variable is not supposed to be there so the clear common followed by the name of the variable that you want to get rid of weight in pounds now i press enter and now this if i type who's again we see that the variable weight in pounds has gone from our memory from the workspace so here there's a small exercise that in my opinion it's very trivial you don't need to do it but in this exercise we define a variable called mass and a variable called age and then the mass variable gets updated so this is very common in many other programming language that what you have on the left hand side will store the new value and on the right hand side of the equal operator you have the old value so the new value of mass will be the old value of mass times two and the new value of age will be the old value of age 122 minus 20. so of course you are free to run this on your on your matlab and check but the uh, good thing about this software carpentry's material is that you also can peek at the solutions and get also some comment basically what i just told you about the left hand side and right hand side of the equal operator okay so the goal of this um, teaching material though was to be able to load some data process the data and then visualize the data so i guess all of you were able to download the zip file containing the data and then you should basically now unzip it so that you can see the content and you can access the content now for me i am i move this zip document in the same place where i want my matlab files to be and specifically in my settings it's in z documents matlab but of course it might be different in your case and then i unzip the data now if you are then in the same case if you did something similar to what i do what i did with ls you would see that you have the zip file matlab dash novice inflammation zip and if you unzipped it in the same folder where you are right now you also have the subfolder matlab novice inflammation so with the terminal window we can actually change directory cd to this matlab dash novice dash inflammation and now if i type pwd i see that the path where i am in the operating system where i am in the hard disk sorry is in documents matlab matlab novice inflammation 
if this folder here that you unzipped is stored in a different location, let's say that it's in under your downloads folder, then you can do CD and then specify the full path of this location. Let's say that you have it in C and then, uh, I don't know, downloads and then MATLAB, novice, whatever is your path. So you can basically, what I'm asking you, you now is to go to the same folder that you've unzipped, wherever that folder is in your operating system, so that you are able to type ls and see two subfolders here. So inside that zip, the data was stored in the subfolder data, and we will use the subfolder results to store the images that we generate from that data. Here there's a nice box in this material about the good enough practices for scientific computing, which links to this paper in, uh, I think was it in PLOS Biology, where they, it, this is actually a very nice paper, I open it quickly, because they really, you know, it, it's one of those papers that help you uh, be good enough, if not the best, when it comes about uh, data management as well as code management and just, you know, don't get crazy with your with your projects. But uh, a good rule is to keep the data in its own folder and the results in its own folder and the code in another folder so that you have things separated and organized. And if you win the lottery and disappear, someone else can continue from your work because they know how the data is organized and what to expect from, from the folder structure. All right, so now basically what we need to test right now is that we are able to load the data into memory. So now we see concept that we are already familiar with. We see that now this patient underscore data is the name of the variable and it's on the left hand side of this assignment operator of this equal. So basically we want to have a variable called patient underscore data and this variable should contain the data that is stored inside the file called data underscore sorry data slash inflammation 01 which basically means that in the folder in the subfolder called data there should be a file called inflammation 01 read matrix is the function that we use to basically pass the name of the file and it will return the values that are stored inside the file so let's type the same command, patient underscore data equal read matrix data slash. You see, I could type everything, inflammation, etc., etc., but I'm a bit lazy. So I just start typing in and then I press the tab button and MATLAB tries to autocomplete the string for me. So now in this data folder, there's actually more than one CSV file that starts with in. But in this specific case, we want to pick the first one here. And so I pick that, I double click, and now you see MATLAB basically auto-completed the, the full name of the file. And then I can close the bracket of the function read matrix and add the semicolon operator at the end because I don't need to see, I, I don't want to see the output of this, of this data. So I press enter. In the bottom here, you see that it was saying busy. The busy would mean that the MATLAB was doing something, in this case, opening the file, loading the content, and moving it into memory, into this patient data variable. If we didn't put the semicolon operator, like we do here in this second command, let's see how it would look like. So I type now the arrow up arrow up goes back to my history and you see here actually the full history of the commands that I've typed but now I don't want to rerun exactly the same command I want to get rid of the semicolon at the end and now as you remember from the beginning by not having the semicolon at the end it means that all the content of the variable patient data will be displayed in the terminal window so let's press enter and now you see yes there's many many numbers, which basically is the content of this matrix. So because this is a big matrix, 
it takes many rows and many columns. And so you see here, we have the name of the variable, patient underscore data. And then here it starts displaying the actual data. So columns from one through 12. And here we have the values of the columns. If we aren't sure how big this matrix is, we can of course run our common whose and we see that now patient data is 60 rows and 40 columns. But there's another common which is size. So size and then the name of the variable, patient underscore data, which is basically telling us what we also see in was how many rows this matrix has and how many columns. So, well, here some comments. I'm not going to read through everything. You can, of course, read the learning materials, teaching materials by yourself. But in general, they're basically writing what I was saying earlier that everything, that all data is stored in a form of multi dimensional array. We have the numbers and the scalar, we have the list of numbers or vectors or arrays, and of course, we have matrices. Now, in this case, for example, we have a two dimensional matrix, but you can have three dimensions, four dimensions, you know, you can have all sorts of uh, multi dimensional arrays, as they say here. And what is interesting is that even characters, strings, sentences, and whatever, even those are arrays, even those are matrices. So then here, they also explain some concept that we didn't really cover earlier, the concept of a class. Now this was a bit familiar for those of you who have learned some other programming language, but the idea, the simple idea to put it in a simple way is how the data is stored in the computer that you're using. So the class is specifying this. Now you see here with the common rules that I'm using, we get the name of the variable, A, the size of the variable, one row and three columns, and also the class of the numbers. So these are called double, which basically means that these numbers are stored with double precision, if I'm not wrong, it's uh, 64, 64 bits used for the, for the storing of this, of this number. But of course, sometimes we might need to load some data that is not stored as double numbers. For example, here they mention another class called integer 16. So that, you know, there are different basic ways of storing numbers in, uh, in MATLAB as in many other programming languages. Maybe one note is about now to load this CSV data into the variable. We've been using this read matrix command. This is quite a recent command. I think it was introduced in 2020, last year, or maybe 2019, I don't remember. But if some of you is using a MATLAB that is a little bit older, then read matrix most likely is not going to work. But then now I'll use the arrow up to go back to the command. So here, instead of read matrix, you can also just use the command load. Load is a generic command that tries to understand what is passed to the command, in this specific case CSV, comma separated value file, and tries to basically figure out if it can be loaded into memory. In this specific case, this should work, so I press enter, and then if I type the variable again, it's still, or actually maybe if I type size, like we did earlier, it still looks the same. So if read matrix is not working for you, you can use load. Okay, now we can move to the second lesson from the software carpentry materials. And now we're gonna talk a little bit more about arrays. Let's have a quick look in thing I can do. There's anything worth mentioning that we missed or some important points. And of course, Thomas, feel free to unmute yourself and comment because I'm trying to keep simple and um, yeah, already here people are discussing that some older version don't have read matrix, CSV read is another good option for that. And um, I don't see any specific to mention, Thomas, if there's anything that we should bring up, feel free to unmute yourself. And 
All right, but seems that we are fine. Nothing at the moment. Yeah, that's so. I hope you also have enough time to type what I'm typing so that you can get the same output. And as I see already in HackMD, when you don't get the same output, try to understand why you're not getting the same output. I guess this is the main advantage of being here together and trying these commands and trying this teaching material rather than you alone doing this by yourself. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit more deeper about arrays. You understood what are arrays. In a specific example here, we had the array A where we were storing three numbers. So if you still have it in your workspace by typing A, you see here it has one, two, three. But of course, what is interesting is the so-called array indexing. So array indexing will basically mean that out of a long array or out of a long matrix, you need to access a specific value. So for example, you know, out of this array, I don't need to access all the three numbers, I just need to access the last one. So in this example here, in the teaching material, they start by creating an A times 8 magic matrix. Let's do the same. So N equals magic of 8. I don't press, I don't append the semicolon so that we can see that the output is the same that they get. And it is. Magic is a nice function, silly function, but it's a funny one. If you type help magic, this function is creating a so called magic magic matrix. You can click here where it says documentation for magic, and it will open another window where there's a little bit more explanation of what magic is doing. But basically, the magic square is a square so that, if I recall correctly, the sum of the rows is the same across all the rows. In our specific case, we decided to use magic, or in this teaching material, they decided to use magic because it's a nice way to generate some random numbers, although they're not random, <laughs> to generate some data, fake data, for our purposes. And now our goal is that, you know, okay, cool, we have this matrix, eight and eight, containing all sorts of values, but we need to access a specific single value out of the matrix. So for example, here they try to get this value 38. Now let's count together. In uh, many programming languages, when you, when you have a matrix or when you have another array, you start counting from zero, which might not be intuitive if you've never done programming before. But on the other end, there's a good reason for kind of start indexing from zero. In many programming languages, MATLAB or Weber is a special case where the counting starts from one, which might be convenient in kind of normal language, but it, you can imagine that it can cause confusion when you try to port some MATLAB code into Python, for example, where the counting starts from zero. But anyway, we need to count basically in which row and which column this number 38 that we need to get. So number 38 is in one, two, three, four, it's in the row five, and it's in one, two, three, four, five, six, and column six. All right, so to get access to check that number, we need to specify the row and the column that we just counted. So the variable m, and now you see, now we don't have any square bracket, we have a round bracket. So it's it's like as m would be a function, of course it's not a function because it's a variable, and we call it with these two parameters, which is the location of the row and the location of the column. So now if I press enter, yes, we get the number 38, which was indeed that column at row five and column six. Rows always come first, so you can think that the first dimension by default is the dimension of rows and then columns. It's the same with matrix algebra, basically. So an index like five, six selects a single element from the, hour, from the array. So if you think of the array earlier, this is a little bit of a special case because there's just one row and three, and three columns. 
which would basically mean that everything is row one and then we want to get column three now you understand that when there's only one row it's a bit useless to specify which row it is and this is why sometimes with one dimension array you can just specify the only dimension that exists so a of three here however we have a two-dimensional matrix and now we have another challenge that instead of getting just a single element like we got earlier the row five and column six now we want to get the full one two three four the full column sorry the full row five so of course one could write it like this five and then start typing all the values that you need to get not exactly like this but you, you get the idea but in matlab there is an operator which is called the column operator so not semicolon but column now the idea of the column operator is basically means give me everything in that dimension so the first dimension was the rows and we say that from the first dimension we want row five and the second dimension there is columns we're saying give me everything so we also type what is there in the teaching material I press enter and yes I get the same the same output so now we basically extracted like we see here in this picture we extracted the row 5 out of this matrix so the column operator is basically an operator that is telling us give us all elements along that dimension so in this specific case you know we can get the whole row 5 now here they have, we have another task instead of just getting a single row or a single element like we said at the beginning now we're going to basically get the so-called slice of this of this matrix we're going to get the first four row and all the columns of this matrix so the slicing the this column operator can also be used for slicing now now the notation for doing this the comment for doing this is one four and then like this i think i don't remember if here in the teaching material they really expand on this but in my opinion it's important to have a look at what's going on so this one column four if you type it in the in the terminal without the m without the brackets it gives you a list of integers so this is basically saying that for m and we are giving a list of integers one two three and four it basically means give us the first four columns four rows sorry so what is interesting here is that, that this column operator can also be useful to create lists now if i would write one column 10 i would get the list of integers up to 10 and one and if i would type minus 10 to 10 I would get all the integers that go from minus 10 to 10. So you see that the column operator is also useful, not just for slicing, like we're doing here, but to create quick lists of integers. We will see later that, you know, we don't need to always have kind of a step of one between these numbers, but sometimes you want, let's say, to get all the only the odd numbers or go, you know, I can kind of spoil the fun already that if we do something like this one, so here we are basically saying with the step of five go from number one and until you reach you know do not go over the number 100 and so here you start seeing that you have one plus five six plus five eleven etc so closing this digression let's go back at our teaching material so now we want to get a slice of this matrix from rows one to four and all the all the columns and we get what they get of course the same could be also done with the columns so now here from this matrix we get a different slice we want to have the last three columns and all the rows so now in the dimension of the rows we say everything all the numbers from the first to the last and in the dimension of the columns we want to get six seven and eight so i could write it like this because six two with the column eight it would basically tell us the list six seven and eight 
but again there's another magic word which is end and in this context the word end is a special word it's a special variable that is telling us go until the last dimension of the matrix n so we don't need to remember that this has eight columns but we can just type end so let's type it and let's see if we get the same and yes we got the same and of course if you don't like end if you really wanted from six to eight independently of how big the matrix was you could have written six column eight and you you get exactly the same so in this context the the keyword or the special word end the special variable end is automatically replaced with the size because if you put type size of m it's actually eight and eight finally we might want to select a sub matrix so instead of getting the all the columns or all the rows like we did earlier here we want to get a little slice of uh, specifically this starts in row four and ends in row six and then starts in column five and ends in column seven and so this is we want to start from row four to row six and then from column five to column seven hopefully i'm going slow enough that you have enough time to type what i'm typing and what we are reading from the learning materials and now you see that yes we get this the same output that we get and the reason is of course once again this column operator because if we extrapolate if we take them out from what is inside the, the round brackets so four column six will give us four five six a list for the rows and five column seven gives us the list for the columns which is column five column six and column seven so as i already spoiled the fun earlier sometimes you want to get you know instead of having consecutive columns you might need to or consecutive rows you might need to jump between rows and between the columns so here specifically they want to get the column number two and column number four one two three four sorry and column number five and then column number eight so there's basically a jump the two plus three is five and plus three is eight so once again with the notation like this we can get all the jumps with, with the jumps of three we can go from the number two to the number eight in our specific case we don't need to write the eight when we are inside the round brackets because matlab knows with the operator end that we want to go until the end of that matrix and then when it comes to the columns we want to get all the columns so we use the just the operator column and we press enter and yes we get exactly what we get there then here they are suggesting you know can we get a checkerboard so now you see that when in the dimension of the rows it starts from row one plus three goes to row four plus three goes to row seven and the column starts from column two plus two goes to four plus two goes to six and plus two goes to eight so we can basically write this with this type of jumping so from row one with the jumps of three until the end and from row from column two with jumps of two until the end and basically we get exactly these numbers here which are the number marked in blue in this learning materials okay so this that we've been all doing is so-called slicing where we in this specific case we sliced the matrix or we picked what we only wanted to pick from the matrix and of course slicing is they define it as more appropriated when we talk about a subsection of an array like uh, you would take a slice of cake so the thing with matlab of course is that matlab everything is a matrix or an array and of course the slicing can also be done with the string 
So if you remember what we were saying earlier that the a string is another type of is another class, but it's basically an array of characters. So now in the variable element, we write this we want to store in the variable element the string oxygen. So if you type it like I'm typing, now I'm typing it without the semicolon, even though in the teaching material they have it with the semicolon. Okay, now the variable element contains an array of characters. We can check with whose and indeed now the variable element is uh, as a size of one times six, so one row and six columns. And the six columns are six letters which are top type, their, their, their class is the class char. All right, so now we can of course treat this array variable, this element, like we were, we, like we were treating the, the number matrix, the, the arrays with numbers. So for example here, if we want to display the first three characters of, the, of this variable element, we could type element one, two, three, and it would give us oxy. So the, the first three letters of the, of the variable, of the array stored in the variable element. Here, they actually use the disp common to display a string and the square brackets is to make an array like we were doing earlier so earlier we were typing something like this a equal with the square bracket one two three so an array of numbers but here i'm now gonna copy paste it from the learning material here there will be a new array where the first part of the array is something that we typed first three characters and the second part of the array is a subset from the other array called element, specifically the first three letters. And so we get something like this. Then they put the disp function around it. So now I type a row up and then I wanna call disp and then the round brackets are for calling the disp function. So then instead of basically reading ants and this as a string, I see a little bit nicer display like this. So then we just see the output there and then I could do the same I'm not going to do it for the for the other characters from four to six so that you get the last three characters of uh, of this variable called element now there's some exercises that maybe you can spend a few minutes to do and write the solution in the HackMD so the first exercise is what is the value of element for to end? And what about element that goes from one with steps of two until the end? Or then element that goes that starts from two until end minus one? All right, so you can basically try this. And then on HackMD, like earlier, you were writing these um, icebreakers. Just pick one row for you and write these three answers for the number one. Of course, I mean, this is, it's, it's fine to spy what other people are answering, but it's, this is a good moment to actually test things and make sure that you get the same that other people are getting. And then the second mini exercise is that for any size array, MATLAB allows us to basically use this column operator to index all the rows. And here they're saying compare the element calling just the element with element and all the and all the kind of all the elements of element and then try to do the same again with m and with m using this you know so you will see that the size of element will be different than the size of element with the column or actually with element it's going to be the same but with m it's going to be different so let's spend, this shouldn't take more than uh, five minutes, let's say four minutes. So I'm gonna put a timer of four minutes and you can go to HackMD and try to write the solutions of these two exercises. I know, and you know that you can also look at the solutions with the button here, but for now, you know, let's look at the solutions later together. 
So four minutes starting now. Okay, four minutes have passed. Um, yes, I want to make one comment um, because uh, I think it's important to know MATLAB is a one based um, programming language. So all arrays and all indices start with one. In most other um, programming languages, um, the numbers of arrays or indices actually start with zero. Um, that's just an important information to keep in mind because 
uh, if you forget about that, you can run into very, well, inconvenient errors or inconvenient situations. So just as a remark. Yeah, this is, this is very, this is an excellent point. This is why maybe it would be, if MATLAB, if this is your first, you know, interaction with the programming language, and if MATLAB is the first programming language that you learn, how can I say, maybe it's not the best language to learn first, that it would be good to understand these things with another language. And then here you are, how can I say, adapting what you already know to the quirks of MATLAB. I think it's in Thomas that only MATLAB and R, as far as I know, I'm sure there's other. I'm pretty sure there are more, but yeah. those are the two popular languages in, sign, in science and uh, anywhere else that I currently can can yeah, yeah. think of that are one-based, everything else is zero-based. I guess the major danger is that th there's other types of danger that with, um, with programming languages like Python, if you start to access, you know, if, if you will type the equivalent of having the length of the matrix, like eight, it would throw an error. So you actually know that something is wrong, but with MATLAB, you know, so, but basically yeah, this is an excellent point, Thomas, that. I think it's particularly important if you have code that you want to transfer from one language to another, um, where you can end up with simply wrong code and worst case, uh, a best case, it just throws an error. Yeah. Worst case, it does something that it's not supposed to do. Yes, excellent point. So I see in Yak and D that many have tried the exercise, or at least you know, a decent amount of people, and excellent that you tried it and wrote the solution. You know, it's not rocket science yet. <laughs> and I'm going to try it myself here. So now I just make sure that the variable element. I press enter so it contains the string oxygen and then the first exercise is to type element that goes from four until the end and yes we get the end of the string and then the second exercise element that goes from one with steps of two until the end and so we should get o y e yeah that's correct if i wanted to have it you know, so basically now we are getting the numbers one, three, and uh, five. If I would start from index two with steps of two, I would get the, uh, what are they called, the uh, even location. So it would be X, J, and N. But here, the last one, they ask us to start from number two with the steps of, well, basically steps of one, and then go until the end, minus one. So let's try it, element two until end minus one and it's basically so starting from the two oxy again so it's it's basically missing the first letter the o and the last letter n i personally like I'm, i understand what matlab is thinking here and i know that he wants to go from the number two until the end of the string minus one so the location what was the size of the string was it six? I don't remember. Yes, yeah, six. So it's basically saying, you know, that this is element from two to five, you know, that we skip the first and we skip the last. But imagine if I would have written it like this. Let's see if my. So you see the kind of, how can I say, confusion here that like. I don't like end minus one. I, I always prefer to explicitly, how can I say, explicitly define how things things should 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 go. So that um, my point being that I would rather write it like this. Uh, what is it? So that the final number is specified rather than letting MATLAB interpret, you know, in, in general, the point that I'm trying to make here is that having extra brackets to define the order of the operator doesn't hurt, improves the readability and make sure that you know what's going on, that this is not going from two to end and everything shifted by one, but this is going from two to n minus one. And then here you already noticed the use of the column 
it basically if you use the column in itself it transforms whatever you have into a single into a single column so with the variable element we will make instead of being a row like it used to be we will make everything as a column and with the variable m of course it will reshape that's the word reshape the matrix into a single column i'm not gonna run it because otherwise i will get a long list of numbers in the matrix command but with size we basically get the 64 elements and into a single column if you're curious to see how this reshaping happens let's call a new variable called m reshaped equals n with the column operator without anything else all right now let's have a look at the first 10 elements of this m reshaped and now let's also have a look at m so you see that we basically have the first column intact but then it kind of switches to the second column so we have two here 55 etc so basically the way that matlab reshapes the matrix m is by giving priority to the first dimension so the first dimension is kept intact and then it takes the column two and basically cuts it and puts it under the column one and so on for all the other columns so it's basically going to read all the elements kind of giving the priority to the to the first dimension all right i guess the solution here don't expand on anything more that i said so key points for this part is that we have rows and columns with matrices and with this notation we can uh, slice or get bits of indexes and then the column operator was very useful for many things now it's exactly 151 so it's time for a break and let's resume at 14 sharp with uh, more to the next part on plotting data
Okay, it's two o'clock, and now it's the last part for this first day of the MATLAB basics. If you see my Zoom window, I'm gonna briefly go to the full screen with the teaching materials. So, just to get an idea where we are, you downloaded the files in the setup page. We understood what MATLAB how MATLAB deals with variables and we got an idea of arrays and how to slice arrays and get sub elements of arrays and matrices. Now we're going to do some basic plotting which also will require some loading of the data. And um, so now we are at the section 3 and we will cover this, we will cover this today. <coughs> so I now also go briefly with the full window with my MATLAB and with the default layout. So you should be able to see in the current folder. So I have it here in the top left on top of my mouse here. You should now be able to see the subfolder data and the subfolder results. So this means that you were able to unzip the file that was provided in the teaching materials and basically browse to the pass where this data and results subfolders are. So if, if you don't see this in your current folder, subwindow here in the default layout, then it means that you are in the wrong folder. I've noticed on HMD sometimes when you unzip something, it might create you know two nested folders with the same name, MATLAB dash novice dash inflammation. So you, you might just need to go until you basically see the same thing that you see here. Uh, you can also check that you are in the right place by typing the command pwd. And so in my case, this is the path that I get. And then with the command dir, you should basically see this, the current folder, the parent folder, these are the dots, and then the subfolder data and the subfolder results. This is important because the commands that we will run are basically looking for data that is inside the subfolder data and so if we will run the same commands in another subfolder in another location our hard disk it wouldn't be able to to find the file and then you would get an error like you know unable to unable to load data all right but uh, i go back to the layout where i'm showing only the command window and again, I'm using the left part of the screen for my MATLAB command and the other side for the learning materials. So you can decide where you want to put your MATLAB command window. Maybe one before we start, I'm actually not the biggest fan of typing commands like we're typing here. I rather do things using an editor, but maybe we will talk about the editor on Wednesday. So for now, let's stick in typing interactive command. But the idea, as you can see, that, you know, okay, it's nice to type comments and get something out of it. But then tomorrow, I might not remember what I was doing, or worse, in a month or in a year, you know. Tomorrow is still easy because I can still, with the arrow up, I can still look at the history window and I see at which point I was. But already, already in one month, I might not be able to remember what I was doing. So using with the editor, if you already want to type editor or just edit, sorry, in the in the MATLAB window, it's basically the year you would type all the commands that you want to type in the in the terminal, but you can type them so that they are saved into a so-called MATLAB script. But maybe let's not worry about this right now. We can talk about editor and MATLAB script first thing on Wednesday. But now let's continue with our goal here. And if you remember, the goal of these uh, learning materials was to load some data and then do something with the data. So, for example, computing the mean, meaning the arithmetic, the uh, average of the numbers that are stored in the data. So, let's see if I already have it in my workspace. So, I type who's. And I still have it, but if in, in case you reset it, in, in case you clear your workspace and you don't have this variable anymore, you can start typing the initial 
and then with the arrow up it basically looks in your history and if you did this earlier this is how you load the data for 01 it's like the first trial you can think that these are like clinical trials so this is the first clinical trial and for this inflammation for these patients that they're testing some drug and then you press enter and again you have the patient data loaded in your in your workspace so to be to make sure that you can run mean so the average of patient data you need to have patient data in your workspace so double check it and yes i have it and the size should be 60 times 40 so 60 rows and 40 columns in this specific case in this type of data 60 are the number of patients which means every row is a patient and 40 if i recall correctly are the number of days so that they follow the level of inflammation of this patient for 40 days right so if we if we type what it's written there so mean is a function that computes the mean of the numbers that are passed so maybe let's have a quick look at what it does with help and then the name of the function mean and here you get the detailed help that mean is the mean value of the elements that are passed here so in this specific case to the function mean the input is the patient underscore data variable but with the column which means that the whole matrix 60 times 40 is reshaped into a single column if you remember earlier we can verify it with size patient underscore data and then just the column operator so yes now we have 2014 sorry 2400 elements into a single column 2400 because the size of this data is 60 times 40 which is 2400 so basically if we type what they are writing there in the teaching material patient underscore data of everything this is like the global average so this is the average of all the days and all the patients and this number doesn't really matter what what is the unit of this number this is just you know to get us to make us play with some data so you know maybe this is in informative i don't know but uh, specifically you know you might we might want to get the mean for example across every day or the mean for each patient independently from the other patients so here yeah here they type help mean like we did already and so here we can also get of course other functions not just the mean so uh, useful functions to get an idea so called the strict descriptive statistic of a data set we could have a look at the maximum or at the minimum so you see here in this bit of code here where they try to display for example the output of maximum of everything there and the output of minimum and also the standard deviation so it's basically the same now i typed arrow up to get the previous one but now instead of mean i could type max which gives me you know the maximum value across all days and across all patients and then with min i would get the minimum value which is zero and once again this is the minimum across all days and all patients and then std the standard deviation which is 46148 so yes i get the same that they got there the difference of course is that here they use the disp function which makes a nice output as you see here the output in the teaching material so that you know it's useful like imagine that at this series of command could be in a script so that every time you run the script you get this nice output rather than interactively typing all right but then as we said earlier when we analyze data we often want to look at partial statistic not just at the global average or global maximum so we want to for example look at the values only for a specific page so here this is kind of you know the slow way of doing it we manually select patient one because we have 60 patients and 40 days so with this i'm gonna type it so that you also have time to type it so if i type patient underscore one equal patient underscore data one and semicolon 
<coughs> sorry so now we are selecting row one which means patient one and all the values all the days for the patient all right so these are the 40 values for this patient we can already look at the values ourselves that it starts at zero then it starts to increase a bit it looks like that the biggest number is 18 towards the middle here and then it goes back again to zero <clears throat> so here for example we can look at the maximum let's do it like they did here with the disp so that the output is a little bit nicer so disp max and the variable is called patient underscore one and I press enter and I get 18 which is also what they get here of course you know we don't really need this extra variable now we define a new variable called patient underscore one but we could have just immediately passed to the function max the you know the slice that we would have need meaning row number one so we could have written how they wrote it here so max and then the variable we use the whole data set but we select row one and please give us all the columns and we get the same number 18. so what we were doing earlier and what we're doing here is that of course we were computing the maximum across all the values that we are passing but it's a little bit more interesting if we could get for example the maximum across all patients for each day or the maximum across all days for each patient <coughs> so for example let's have a look at this at this um, picture here so in this case they would do the average across the first dimension now you remember that the rows were patients and the columns were days so if we do the average across the first dimension it would mean for day one across all patients what would be the average so kind of the group average for day one and then we repeat it for day two and day three etc or then we might not care about the average the daily average maybe we, we care more about the single patient data but then we need to move on the second dimension across the second dimension so that the mean needs to operate kind of like we did there we fixed patient one and we do the average across all days for patient one and patient two and so on so to do this with matlab it would be very slow if you know we need to always define a new variable call it patient underscore one patient underscore two etc you can understand that it's, it would be unsustainable but there is a quick way to do this so the mean actually takes a second parameter so what basically this means the mean is a function a matlab function that and then between the round brackets here we write the parameters that this function takes the input if we only write it with just one parameter like we did earlier it will return the mean across the first dimension but it can but we can also tell sometimes that we don't want the mean across the first dimension here sometimes we want it across the second dimension of course you don't need to remember this by heart this is why it's always useful to type help mean and then you know basically check okay what was what does mean one and then you see that when mean is called with two parameters the first one is the data is the matrix that you're passing and the second one can be the dimension you know that you want like basically you see in this picture with the rows and the columns okay so now if we type then mean of our data across the first dimension now you would basically do the mean across all patients for each day so we should end up with 40 values which is the kind of daily average across all the patients for this trial now I press enter and yes we get numbers that go from columns 1 to columns 40 so 40 numbers with these average values and these are the same or as same as possible you see that there's some rounding differences here with the data that we get from this uh, from this uh, course but then of course sometimes as we know the mean function instead of having the average across the first dimension we might want to have the average across the second dimension 
because each individual patient maybe the information is more important than than each individual day so then we can use this so i go with the arrow up and instead of having one as the second parameter i type the number two and now we get this basically the average across all the patients or for each patient the average across all the days and now of course in this case if i look at the size of the mean of the patient data across second dimension this should be 60. yes we have 60 rows because we have 60 patients and here this is what they exactly did so we have 60 rows and 60 patients all right so now we did some very simple processing i know that maybe in your field you might do much more advanced processing but looking at the minimum and the maximum and the mean of the data you have is like you know always good independently of whatever field of science you're working with so another good way of getting an idea of what's in your data is of course plotting the data looking at means and average numbers might be a bit difficult to get an idea of what's in the data so now we do the most simple type of plotting that we can do with this type of uh, data which is the two-dimensional matrix so here we do a so-called heat map and hopefully you are able to run the same and the heat map is done with this function called image sc where sc stands for scale if you're curious about the function you can always type help image sc and basically displays an image with scaled colors because this is what it does the scaling means that it kind of tries to make sure that you cover all the range of the data that you all the range of the numbers that you have in your data so that you can visualize the full data set so let's try together image sc patient underscore data and let's press enter and now you should have this you should see basically a plot that is identical to the one in the teaching materials we still miss the title and the labels because they're very important always label your axis so we can do it with some uh, with some uh, other comments so matlab has the common title so title and we call it data for trial one i'm inventing the title you can put what you want and now this common here title with the string it just gives that string as a kind of a title for that image then we need to give some labels for the axis so in the x meaning from left to right we have days and so i give x label and then i pass to the x label function days the string days and you see now in the image that we get days and then in the y label we would have patients that go from 1 to 60 or the 60 patient and then i press enter and now we have patients i personally don't think that we are done here and i'm sorry that the people who prepared this teaching material they didn't think of this but i think it's also very important to know the value of the numbers that we are seeing all right in this case we don't really know what they measured but you know in your field you know if you are dealing with kilograms or with meters or whatever is your unit so when it comes to these type of heat maps if you type color bar that gives you basically the mapping to read these values so that you know that the very bright yellow gives you you know it, that in this location the very bright yellow corresponds to a value of 20 and that very dark blue will have a you know a value of zero so that basically you can now read the data and know that yes since it's kind of increasing for each patient from zero to 20 for some patient a little bit smaller and kind of on the day around the day 20 you have some sort of a maximum and then it goes down back to the level zero so all right basically here they just write what i just told you and now of course we want to also have some other plot because now with this image sc 
we have an idea of the whole data set across all the age and across all patients but now we want to have a look at what we already see with our eyes for example that the daily average is kind of increasing in the middle and then going down again so if you remember that earlier we were typing mean of patient underscore data across the first dimension which basically means across all subjects and this was giving us 40 values for 40 days i press enter and yes 40 values now i can just call another function the function plot that will get this as a input so now this function plot gets as an input mean of patient data along the first dimension now i press enter and i get the same picture that they also get and you should also get the same picture once again we did not label our axis and it's always important to label our axis never save anything if the axis are not labeled so we first give it a title daily average across patients then we can give it an x x label it's days and the y label is uh, average inflammation whatever is the <clears throat> actual measure unit that they use in this and now you have a picture you know that has axis and has everything and you know that now you you are visualizing the daily average across all across all patients um right so um, i don't see anything that i can be or i see something but hopefully people are getting their help now in this um, plotting that we want to do we also want to get an idea of what is the maximum for example across the days and what would be the minimum so if you see my mouse on this plot it's actually interesting that with matlab if you have a recent matlab also the previous one if you move the mouse on top of the plot you can get some insights on the data so for example now i stopped in this uh, x equal to 7 so on the seventh day and the average is 3.8 and then i move the mouse to the top here so it's day 21 and the average is 13. but of course you can imagine that this is just the average value i could have another plot which could look at the maximum across all patients for each day or look at the minimum across all patients for each day and this is exactly what they do in the next in the next example here so you notice that every time i'm closing the window and this is so that matlab will basically create a new window and get rid of the previous data this is the usual behavior of matlab but we can check later if there's time they one can actually kind of hold the content of the window that you see and plot stuff on top of the window but now let's keep things simple i close the window and now we try to plot the maximum across all the patients for each day so now you see that with mean we were just we just needed to call pass the matrix of the data and then the dimension but max has a little bit different notation so if i have a look at the help of max basically the dimension should be specified as a second parameter the actual second parameter of this max function if you need the max between two numbers between two elements you know that if i would call it with max and one and four now it would give me the maximum between these two elements but here in our specific case we don't have a second element to compare and this is why the max function is called with this empty empty array which is just two two square brackets and this is you see it also in the help of the max function that if you need to go along a specific dimension you pass all your data empty array and then the dimension that you want to so in this case we want to have a plot of the maximum of patient data we don't have a second input for max but we have a third input which is the first dimension i close the round brackets for the max function i close the round bracket for the plot 
I press enter and now we get something like that, that once again we should have we should have a label for our axis I'm too lazy so I go arrow up and I reuse the same labels that I typed earlier well except that now the y label is not average inflammation but it would be maximum maximum inflammation so now here we know that you know for day five let's use our mouse for days five across all patients the maximum level of, of inflammation is four all right and then we could do the same of course using the minimum also the mean function is like the max function where the second parameter is not needed if you don't have a value to compare and so because of that it's called in a similar fashion now i try something a little bit more advanced than what is shown in the teaching material because now i would like to actually plot this minimum inflammation on top of this maximum inflammation so i'm gonna type hold on which is an instruction that matlab is now telling to figure one please the next type command don't delete everything keep what you have there and put something on top now i type hold on and then instead of plotting the maximum i add plotting of the minimum and now you see now i i get in the same figure this starts to become more informative more and easier to read that this is kind of like in, in the space between the blue curve and the what is that red that is basically where my data is living so for every day we know what is the maximum and we know the minimum we can actually scroll back up and find where we call the mean and now in the same figure we have the maximum across all days the minimum across all days and the average so now we get a kind of a good descriptive statistic for our for our goal in some cases it's useful to have them overlap like this but in some other cases you might like it might be more clear that things are not overlapping because maybe you have lots of different data and you know they don't share maybe the same axis like here that all the data share days so we can have a look at how kind of arrange the plots data but it would be good if now you spend a few minutes trying these simple exercises and so the first exercise saying here when we plot just one variable using plot example plot of some vector what do the x value represent so you can answer again the hack and be and then the second exercise will be why are the vertical lines in our plot of the minimum inflammation per day not perfectly vertical so they're talking about this line here you see that from the line the location x16 then it jumps to 18 so you know and 17 so you can think why the lines are not exactly like a step and then last food for thought is you should try to create a plot showing the standard deviation of the inflammation data for each day across all patients so something similar but instead of calling the function max or the function mean or or min you should call the function std and you might want to check the documentation for the function of the standard deviation so i know that this exercise might take some time but it's okay if you are able to do some of it and write on hack and be i'm gonna consider i'm gonna give five minutes but um, maybe we can give we can be interactive let's i'll switch on again the microphone in five minutes and then if people want more time to try these things they can ask for more so now it's a uh, 1429 we can go we can continue until 1435 i can switch my microphone again 1435 
Okay, so we got five minutes. I don't know if you need more time to think about these things or I guess we can also slowly talk through and you can still try. So the first question here is when we plot just one variable, what do the X values represent? So basically you have to think it that the values are the vectors that we are plotting, the arrays. So I'm inventing, let's see if we still have that array A that we had at the beginning. A equal one, two, three, yes. So if I would plot A, I would just get these three numbers. Now plot alone, it's a little bit difficult to show, to understand that the numbers that are plotted here are actually just these three values. Here one could argue that you know that we have all sorts of the values from one to three so there are actually lots of useful other things that we can pass to the plot function and for example now with these strings here with the star and with the line i'm actually specifying you know what the values in this array these three values can you also put a star on them so that i know that I see the actual data and not this interpolation, this linear interpolation that is between them. And so by doing that, now I see that, you know, there are three actual values and that they are stored. Basically this X is the index number. So in the index one, I have number one, in the index two, number two, etc. Let's try something a little bit more complex. So if you think, if you remember we called mean of patient data let's store it in a variable so now i define a variable called mean underscore patient where i'm storing the mean and now i can call the plot function with mean underscore patient and i'm also passing this star and this line so this picture is much clearer than the picture that they were showing us in the in the teaching material because now i know that the actual data points are just the stars and the things in the middle is just you know connected dots which in this case it's the most simple interpolation which is the nearest you know kind of the line between the two neighbors but of course you can imagine that sometimes you want to have fancier interpolation well not fancier but you know consider that maybe you don't you 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 want to have some sort of average across multiple days this goes beyond this basic matter this is something that we cover in matlab advanced but now this picture is much much more clear and now this picture is basically answering to all the questions in this problem here because now we can understand why you know the numbers in the minimum does do not jump as a as a step but they but they have always a slope like they they say here in the in the second question sorry so let's have a plot of the minimum so this was the common that we had earlier but now to make things clear i also add this star and line which basically for the function plot i'm passing you know i'm telling use the star to mark the actual data points and line to connect to connect the dots to connect the stars and now here it's clear why we don't have vertical lines because one dot is in location uh, let me check this is in location 12 so in the index 12 and the value is 2 and the next one it's in the index 13 so you understand you see that you know if we would need to have a vertical line it would it would basically mean that on the same index there would be two values that you know that it would go when it's on index 12 with the value 2 and still in the index 12 or kind of in the x 12 with a value 3. So now of course this is very simple. Now plot is called with only one parameter, one data, meaning one array in this case. The plot can actually accept more parameters. I find it very useful myself to then explore what would be the options that I could use plot and this is how you basically learn in the end how to do plot you're not going to learn it with this teaching material here 
So what you can do is, for example, I now maximize the browser window. You can just search for MATLAB plot and most likely, if not always, the first sort answer is the help function from MATLAB. And here you see the syntax of the common plot. Yes. Where what I also find useful in the documentation, yes, is the fact that there are examples that one can immediately try. So, for example, here, you know, you see that they call the plot not just with the y, not just with one number like we were calling here, but with an x and a y. So now you can get a little bit different story because you can specify the axes. They don't need to be the indexes like we had in our picture. And in this specific case, they make x to go from 0 to 2, the value of, of pi, so the full circle, with a specific step that it doesn't have to be integer. So you see that already with what you learned today, you cannot, you're already able to read that x is, an, is, a, is a vector, is an array that goes from 0 to 2 pi with jumps of pi divided by 100. And then y is the function sin, the sinus curve of the values that are stored in x. And then when plot is called with x and y, now we can actually, you know, let's run the same command. So I'm literally copy pasting it, but I'm lazy here. But now in the plot, I could actually also add this star and this line. So I'm basically asking MATLAB, can you also show me where the actual points are, not just the interpolation? And yeah, I guess I lost it because it's behind the windows, but I do like this. And now you see compared to the example that we have there in the in the MATLAB documentation, now we see that there are actually all the stars, all the actual data points. Here with the window, you can actually, you can also zoom in and for example, select a small interval and here you, you basically see all the, you know, the actual values that are the ones in the star and the interpolation that is, there are the lines. Okay. But let's go back to our cases. So this basically has answer to question two and then the question three want us to plot and instead of plotting the minimum or the maximum we would like to see the standard deviation so it's good to check what this standard deviation function was so i'm typing help standard deviation and here i can already see that dim cannot be the second parameter like we had in mean but it has to be the last parameter so then I might start wondering, okay, what is this second parameter doing? So the second parameter normalizes and produced blah, blah, blah. So it looks like that if the second parameter is zero, this is the same as calling standard deviation without any parameter. All right, so it's clear that what I need to do is then something like that. So let me go back. So it's something like here, like we did for the minimum, but now the second parameter should be zero. And the last parameter is to the dimension. So in this case, it goes along the first dimension. And so basically this is the standard deviation for the patient data across the first dimension. So we have 40 days and the standard deviation across the subject. If we wanted to have across the patients, or across the days by fixing the patients, we would have F60 values like this. Now you understand also that because those days were consecutive days, it kind of made sense to plot them as a time series. But these now, you know, if you care about data visualization, one could say that this is wrong because these are just patients. There's no need to connect the patients, the patient whatever n minus one has nothing to do with the patient n. So then one could actually get rid of the lines and just plot the data for the patients. So now here you would have that these are patients that go from one to 60 and then kind of the, the cloud of all the data points for each patient. I remove basically the lines in the plot comma because in this case, this is not a time series and there is no 
kind of logical reason to connect neighboring neighboring dots neighboring stars okay so one last thing before we leave <clears throat> is the fact that often when you look at scientific publications you you might have them in the same figure you know you, you you don't have a single figure let's say where this was the maximum and this was the minimum you might want to combine multiple plots like we did here into the same into the same figure and this is done with the common subplot so let's try the common here i close all the windows to make sure that i don't have anything open so the idea is that when i call subplot and my subplot wants to have I basically need to tell you how many plots are inside this or how many subplots are inside the figure that I'm creating. And this figure specifically has one row of plots and two columns of plots. So that basically I'm saying that you know this figure here has one row of plots and there's two plots inside, two columns of plots. So I say one row, two columns, and then I pick location one. So start from the first plot. So basically what happens now is that I'm telling MATLAB can you prepare a figure that will have two subplots in one row and two columns and start preparing the location one. So now MATLAB made an empty figure as it's ready to accept some plot commands for the first subplot and now the first subplots we want to have the maximum. So I'm lazy, I use the arrow up and I'm sure it will come up. Yes, here's the maximum. All right, I press enter, and now I got the first subplot. And of course, I need to label. I again am lazy. I just start typing the command, which lab, and then I press arrow up, and it finds the completion. And then the Y label, it was the maximum. And the title, it was daily average or actually in this it was daily maximum across the regions and then now we are done with the first subplot but we want to have a second subplot so here close to the previous subplot we want to now tell MATLAB in the second subplot please plot the minimum all right so first we need to tell MATLAB okay stop using this subplot and switch to the next one so to the second index and now instead of plotting the maximum i'm gonna you see that i don't need to retype everything with arrow up and arrow down i'm able to find the closest thing and just edit what i need and now i press enter and again the labels so x label is days y label well it's not maximum but it's minimum and the title is daily minimum across patients all right so basically with this simple commands called subplot instead of having many figures for many plots now in, in, in kind of into a same into a single figure into basically one figure window inside matlab we can have you know multiple subplots and you know we could have had more if we needed let's say two times two amounts of plots but then this we will cover it in the in the, on, on wednesday action okay so there's still 10 minutes left which we could use to get some final feedback i don't see any questions in hackmd so hopefully everything was quite clear so for the feedback of the day it's always good to write something positive and something which can be improved this is is i'm trying to be you know if i can say something from the previous years that in general there's some people that are the first time that they might be actually writing code and coding together so being slow has always been been you know a value for this course in the past years but every year you know you are different you're a different audience from every year so you know if you feel that this is too basic that this is too slow 
this is the moment where you can when you can recommend something which is also important if you think that this is fine you should write it on the on the hack and be because then it means you know that we can adapt for the second day <clears throat> and uh, the teaching materials and as i said in the beginning i'm sticking as much as possible to the teaching materials and the advantage is that you can you know go anywhere and say you've taken that course which is there publicly you don't need to you know it's uh, it's public knowledge what has been learned here but then uh, when i when i think that there's some points where teaching materials could be improved i always try to mention it and, and show always something a little bit more advanced or clarify some bits here and there so now it's important that you write on how can be because as usual if you don't vote people will you know decide for something that you did not want i see at least um five people writing on how can be so please leave your feedback if everything is fine write it anyway which means that also for the second day on wednesday we can keep a similar rhythm in a similar way but if you want if you have comments it's now the time to to specify it so yeah i guess that's it if you have more questions and comments of course i can be so was there open i didn't spot anything that is worth mentioning but of course thomas can also switch on his microphone if there's something to clarify or extend <clears throat> and um, in the hack and be itself in the top on the same hack and be there's also other useful links and there's also a series of uh, uh, q a or some frequently asked questions that people have asked and specifically you can see that there's already the recordings from last year on youtube the record loads are very similar if not, if not identical so if you know that you will miss wednesday episode you can easily rewatch it on youtube it's basically the same and it's what we did last year this is also i'm wondering i don't i'm not sure if these recordings this year will go to youtube as we already have a copy and nothing has really changed as the material is the same but for sure we can share the recording with you here if you find them useful all right let's have a... i guess that's fine so if you don't have any other questions or comments you can just go i now stop recording so that you also have a chance to unmute yourself and say something if you if you wish <clears throat>